This cinema lens resolves the only two complaints I have about my Sony FX30. And the first one is the low light or high ISO performance. And the other is the camera doesn't have the same ability to sort of blur that background and give me the same subject isolation that I get in my full frame cameras. But this is a 50 millimeter T1.05 cinema lens. And this thing lets so much light in and the iris opens so wide that it actually eliminates both of those disadvantages that my Sony FX30 has over my full frame cameras. And used side by side in the same environment, I was actually getting better performance, better low light and better subject isolation using this lens on my FX30 than I was my full frame A7 IV. And the first place I tested this lens was on a camping trip and I was shooting in the dead of night. We had no moonlight and I was strictly using sort of the flames of the fire to light the faces of the people around the fire. And when I got home and checked the footage, I was absolutely shocked at how clean the footage was, how much detail there was, how good the skin tones looked in almost complete darkness. Now on the same night, I also had my Sony a7 IV with me and I was shooting with a lens that had a maximum aperture of f1.8. And what I was finding is the footage coming out of that camera was not nearly as clean as what I was getting out of the FX30 with this T1.05. And the reason this lens is so powerful for a crop sensor camera is the fact that you cannot use this lens on a full frame camera. It is a crop sensor lens. And to my knowledge, I don't know if there is even a cinema lens that you can use on a full frame camera that goes to T1.05. And if there was, it would probably cost $30,000 or something like this. This is a lens that costs under $400. This lens was sent out to me for the purpose of making this video, but all opinions are my own, and what you're seeing is the real world results of me using this lens. I will also put some links in the description down below to the best pricing I could find on this lens. And just to give you some of the stats on what we're talking about here when we're comparing sort of a full frame lens on a full frame camera to this sort of crop sensor cinema lens on the crop sensor camera, if I am shooting at ISO 800 on my Sony FX30, at T1.05, I'm gonna be at ISO 800. If I'm shooting on my Sony a7 IV with a lens that goes to a maximum, say, f1.4, I'm gonna be shooting at 1600 ISO. So this lens actually gets you sort of half or double the light input, and you're able to cut your ISO in half. Now that's if you are actually using an f1.4 lens on your full frame camera. And if you look at a good 50 millimeter, sort of even f1.4 lens for the Sony a7 IV, that's gonna be quite an expensive lens. So you still got twice the, the ISO, twice the level of ISO, half the level of light, but you're also going to buy a, be looking at a lens that's probably five times the price, four times the price. It is a huge, huge price difference. So this actually gets you better performance and it is a cheaper option. And this gets even more extreme if we look at something like T2. So this is uh, 1.05, if we compare that to T2 or F2, now that full frame camera is shooting at ISO 3200 and the Sony FX30 is still shooting at sort of ISO 800. Now I have been talking T stops and F stops and that might be a little bit confusing. And just to sort of tell you what the difference is, cinema lenses are always rated in T stops. And photography lenses are rated in f-stops. And an f-stop just tells you how big the opening is in the back of the lens that lets the light in to hit the sensor. It doesn't actually tell you how much light is hitting the sensor. And between two different photography lenses, one that's 1.4 and another one that's 1.4, because they have different types of glass elements and amounts of glass and thickness of glass elements, there can be a difference in the amount of light that's actually hitting the sensor between one f1.4 cam or one f1.4 lens and another f1.4 lens. T-stops in cinema lenses takes that into account. So T-stops isn't actually telling you how big the opening is, it's actually telling you how much light is hitting the sensor. Now, all things being equal, when you compare a T-stop to an F-stop, they're very, very similar. So you would commonly find a lens that has a T-stop of 1.4 would actually have a maximum aperture of F1.4 or very, very close as well. So for the purpose of this discussion and keeping things simple, we can really just talk about T-stops and F-stops sort of reasonably interchangeably because 
they are approximately the same thing. Now, the other thing this lens does for you is it allows you to get a very, very shallow depth of field. And this is an extremely powerful thing when shooting movies and storytelling. And that's because you can have any given scene where there's a number of different elements in the scene. And if you can use shallow depth of field to isolate the subject that you're trying to get the viewer to look at or focus on and blur out everything before that subject and everything after that subject, it really gives them a clear indication of what the shot's all about and who they should be focusing their attention on. And I'll just throw a, a sort of an example on screen now. I was just sitting in a cafe, sort of having a bit of lunch, and there was an empty bowl on the table in front of me. And I got a shot of the bowl and pretty much everything in the foreground and everything in the background is blurry and out of focus in a way that I don't think I've ever seen from any lens I've ever used before because this thing goes to this T1.05. Now, I then took a shot with almost the identical framing, and what you're gonna see is the bowl is still in the foreground, but you can't really even see the bowl. It's just a blurry mess. And when you look at this shot, what your focus is gonna be on is on the person. Now, in the original shot, that person was still sitting there and they were in the background. They were just a blurry mess. So one shot might tell you, maybe it's in a scene where somebody just got up from the table and they left the empty bowl behind and sort of, their nemesis has put sleeping potion or poison in the bowl and there's the shot of the empty bowl and oh no, they ate it. And this other one is a shot of a guy and maybe he's going about his life and something has happened in his life and we want you to sort of think about him, empathize with him and look at him and your focus is on him. But the framing is almost identical. All we have used is shallow depth of field effect to draw the viewer's attention to sort of one place or another. Now, the other thing I should say is just because you have a lens that goes to T1.05 and allows you to blur out everything except for your subject in the frame, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to use it that way. You can stop the aperture down and get a greater depth of field, have more in focus, and that might allow you to sort of show the subject in the scene they're in because maybe the story is that this person is in an environment that we want to show what's happening around them. In that case, we just sort of shut the aperture down or we shut the iris down to get a deeper depth of field. So it's not like we're just stuck shooting with a shallow depth of field. We can sort of use this any way we want. So it's an incredibly powerful tool, but when we compare that to a lens that might go to f1.4 or f2 or t1.4 or t2, this is kind of like a bonus mode. It's like a turbo boost in your storytelling because it allows you to really, really isolate that subject in situations that you want to. But if you don't want to, you just close the aperture down, close the iris down, and you get a deeper depth of field, and you tell a different story with that shot. Now, when we look at the images coming out of this lens, it is sort of similar to a lot of, well, a lot more expensive cinema lenses out there. And often what you find from cinema lenses, they give a little bit more of a filmic look, a, a little bit slightly lower contrast, photography lenses are generally designed to get that super sharp, high contrast image. This lens still renders an amazing amount of detail. There is plenty of detail, but it's just slightly lower contrast, just slightly more filmic. And I think the images that I'm getting out of this lens look a lot more like something you'd see on a Hollywood movie screen than what I'm getting out of my photography lenses on my FX30. When we look at sharpness and detail, the one place that this lens doesn't perform well, and neither does any other lens that I have tested that goes to sort of T1.05 or F1.05 or below is, the close-up image quality is not great. And that means if you're getting very, very close to a subject and focusing on that subject, and you're shooting at T1.05, you're gonna get kind of sort of a smeary, sort of imperfect image. I think this has to do with the physics of making a lens that opens this wide. I'm not exactly sure, but I haven't tested a single lens that opens this wide that has good close-up image quality. Now. If you do want to get a close-up shot, you can just stop that aperture down to sort of f1.4, t1.4, t2.0, t2 and you're going to get a great detailed image, and it's absolutely fine. Also, because you are so close to that object, and your depth of field and how blurry your background is not only relies on how big the opening is in the back of the lens, but it also relies on how close you get to your subject, you're still gonna get an extremely blurry background, even if you're shooting at sort of T2.0. We're also not talking sort of a normal distance from a subject like you do for a headshot or head and shoulder shot. We're talking like more of a pseudo macro when you're really, really close on top of something. Now, when we look at general image sharpness across the frame at sort of not close up image quality, 
quality so that when we move back to more of a standard distance, what you're gonna find is this lens is very, very sharp, especially for video. Now, I want to preface that we really have to look at cinema lenses and video lenses in a slightly different light than the way we look at photography lenses. That's because just using the FX30 as an example, in the FX30, we have a 26 megapixel sensor. If you take a photo with this camera, you're gonna get a 26 megapixel photo. That is a lot of detail in a very small area, and that puts a lot of stress on any lens that you're using on this camera. But if you're shooting 4K video, which is what this camera is intended for, and it's what this lens is intended for, what you're gonna find is a 4K video is a series of eight megapixel photos. So we're talking eight megapixels versus 26 megapixels. So when we're talking about lenses that are good for video and sharp for video, video is so much less demanding on a lens than a 26 megapixel photo. Like this is a huge difference. I mean, eight megapixels is what? Uh, a third of the, of the size. So it's putting about 30% of the resolving power that the lens needs to look sharp in video versus photography. And I found the sharpness in this lens to be more than adequate other than that close-up image quality that I mentioned earlier. And if you do feel like you just want a little bit more detail or you wanna clean up the image a little bit, you don't actually have to shoot at T1.05. If you just shut it down to sort of T1.4, T2, now that's gonna be a very, very clinical image, very sharp image. And now the resolving power of this lens starts to sort of approach those photography lenses that do resolve 26 megapixels. So, even if you want a really sharp clinical image, all you gotta do is stop it down a little bit. And when we compare this to an f1.4 lens, you can kind of even think of the T1.05 as almost a bonus mode. So you might shoot a lot of your production at sort of T1.4, T2.0, which would be more typical uh, T stops to actually shoot video in. And then when you really wanna get that scene where you're sort of isolating your subject and you've got this incredible blurry background and foreground, you've got that T1.05 as sort of a bonus mode. Now, probably more important than the sharpness and detail, at least to me, is the background blur and the quality of the background blur. And the quality of the background blur in this lens is absolutely beautiful. It's just dreamy, creamy, and smooth, and just it creates this beautiful backdrop for the subject that you're trying to isolate in your shot. Now, I think this is super important and so much more important than sharpness and detail in general because when you're taking a shot and you're at T1.05 and you've got sort of a person in the middle of frame, probably around 15 to 20% of your image is actually in focus. The rest of the whole thing is out of focus. So mostly what the viewer is looking at is an out of focus background. So we really want that out of focus background to be really, really nice because it's most of your image. So I think this lens performs very, very well in that regard. And I was super, super happy with the background blur, particularly wide open at T1.05. Now we look at the build quality on this lens, it's absolutely incredible. It is a full metal lens. It's got a metal lens mount. It even has a metal lens cap. I mean, this thing is honestly built like a tank and it probably weighs I don't know, I would guess it weighs three to four times, maybe even more, the actual weight of the FX30 body itself. So it is an extremely well-built lens. It also has a aperture and focus ring that were extremely well damped and they are geared. This lens can actually be bought as part of a set or as a lens that you can match later on. There is a 25 mil, 33 mil, 12 mil, and 50 mil lens and they all have the same gearing. So if you are using sort of a focus pull system, you can swap those lenses in and out and the focus gears are gonna line up. Uh, the, the actual lens coatings and the images coming out of the lenses are also supposed to be very similar. That way, if you use sort of use one lens and then use another lens on a production, you're not gonna have to sort of mess with color grading or anything to try to make the shots match. In theory, they should match because they're part of a set and the image quality should be very similar. Now, usually I point out the flaws of any product that I am talking about. And to me, this lens doesn't have a whole lot of flaws for what it is, particularly when you look at the price point. And 
I think the only thing that I think would be deal breakers for some people is the fact that it's a manual aperture, manual focus lens. I know some people don't wanna mess with that nowadays, but I actually find manual focus, manual aperture sort of quite easy to do now. You just have to get a little bit of practice at it. And all the videos that you've seen in this uh, video have been shot using the manual focus and manual aperture. And for me, if you wanna get practice with manual focus, manual aperture, all you gotta do is throw a manual lens on it, just walk around and shoot with it for a while. You'll be surprised how intuitive it becomes. The other thing is in the past, if you've tried to manual focus with what's called a focus by wire lens, which pretty much all the modern lenses are now, that means the turning the actual focus ring just sends an electronic message to the camera body, and then the camera body moves the focus in and out. Those are a lot harder to use than a proper manual focus lens, which you really quickly get a feel for and you know exactly where you are in your focus range. So if you haven't used a true manual focus lens, particularly a cinema lens like this, then I think you probably really haven't given, given manual focus a fair go yet. So who's this lens for? I think it's for anybody who owns the FX30 and wants to get those sort of Hollywood style or Hollywood look shots out of this camera. It's also a great budget option because there really is nothing comparable to this lens at this price point, which will get you these kind of results. Now, if you own the FX30 and you're having trouble getting great results out of the audio handle, or if you're gonna buy the FX30 and you're not sure if you should buy that XLR top handle, I've just thrown a video on screen now I've had a lot of problems with this top handle that you should probably be aware of. There are some fixes, but there's actually some better products out there for a lot of people. So if you're not sure about that Sony FX30 audio handle, then just check out this video.